Welcome back to Grizzly History. Michael and I are sorry to have kept you waiting on this episode, but in the last month, we were not simply planning out this episode, but also planning out the entire series of which this is a part of. That series is called Ends of the Earth, and in it we intend to explore stories about exploration around the Earth's poles. We select these stories with care because we believe that the disasters suffered by these explorers, often caused or made worse by their own reckless decision-making and unmerited hubris, serve as microcosms for the often reckless way in which nations sought imperial glory by setting out to conquer Earth's farthest-flung corners. To be sure, there were sensible reasons to explore the polar lands, some of which we will get into in this episode. But the incessant note of national pride that pushed these explorations forward did so more for purposes of vanity rather than practicality. Let me just say up front that the history of the Arctic and Antarctic is titanic, and you could easily devote entire podcasts to those subjects alone. They're full of not only disasters, but triumphs and heroism, so please don't walk away from this series thinking that the story of polar exploration was simply a tale of one disaster followed by another. Our tales, which I've planned to coincide with winter for extra effect for our audience in the Northern Hemisphere, covers approximately a hundred years, so remember that during that time there were a good many expeditions meeting with success and discovery, thus pressing the race for the poles onwards. But, alas, this is grisly history, not pleasant history. Now let's turn to our first subject in this frigid saga, Sir John Franklin. If you have even a passing familiarity with Arctic exploration, then you probably have heard the name Sir John Franklin, and probably know that his final Canadian expedition set back British Arctic exploration for decades. Rest assured, we will get there in time. But today, we're going to look at a different story. The story of how Captain Sir John Franklin, one-time governor in Arctic night, became known as the man who ate his shoes. Before we talk about the man who ate his shoes, let's talk about what that man was searching for. Over a thousand miles north of Canada lies the Arctic Archipelago. Here, stretching on across a desolate landscape of barren rock and jagged ice, over 350,000 islands stretch from Greenland to Alaska. The entire region is over 500,000 square miles of some of the most brutal inhabited lands on Earth. Only an estimated 14,000 people occupy an area that could fit California two and a half times over. To sail through this region would be to complete the mythic Northwest Passage, something that scant few people could ever claim to do. To this day, commercial travel through the passage is only partially viable due to climate change and advances in shipbuilding. Over 150 years ago, such a journey would have been suicide. While this may seem obvious now, it was not grasped a century and a half ago because much of the Earth's far north had not yet been mapped and discovered. Was there another continent in the far north? Was there an open polar sea? No one knew for sure. What was known to Europeans at the time was that people lived in the far north. And if people could live in the extreme north, then surely it could be navigated. The importance of navigating a northwest passage had everything to do with trade. Consider the world and its oceans 200 years ago. The great empires of Europe acquired most of their trade goods from Asia and the Americas, virtually all of which was transported by ship. In the age of sail, this was not a fast affair. It could take an East India Company ship departing from Blackwell as many as four to five months to reach India, and as many as five to six to reach China. Before 1869, there was no Suez Canal, nor was there a Panama Canal, meaning anyone wishing to sail to and from Europe and Asia 
had to either sail all the way around Africa by way of the Cape of Good Hope or South America by way of the Strait of Magellan. These two crucial points, which were historically held by Portugal and Spain respectively, were hotly contested between Europe's empires. Spain in particular was fiercely aggressive about defending its claims, and it claimed quite a lot of the New World. Hence, trade ships often had to go escorted by their nation's navies, creating a great burden of time and resources. This naturally got powerful men thinking, what if there was another way to transport goods, one which took less time and less escorts? Thus, attention to the unknown far north and the idea of sailing over the top of the world began to make its way into the marketplace of ideas. The 1819 Copper Mine Expedition was born of that discussion, and it was delivered, if you will, by Britain's Second Secretary of the Admiralty, Sir John Barrow, a highly powerful man who obsessively sought the passage for his nearly 40 years in power. Before we tell the tale of this ill-fated adventure, let's take a minute to contextualize how much was known of Canada's far north and what compelled Sir John Barrow to get a better understanding of just what Franklin's team was up against. At this point in time, there was more than 200 years worth of history related to the exploration of Arctic waters. To give even a bird's eye view to all that happened in that time would probably take its own episode, so I'm just going to highlight some key points that would go on to be relevant to Franklin. To begin, let's get the most basic picture of Canada's northern geography in our minds. Please note that this is probably going to be confusing, and we will have a map up on our social media, but I'm going to try to just paint a basic picture for you. Scanning from the east to the west, you will notice that the lower third of Canada looks a bit like a misshapen hook, with the provinces of Quebec and Newfoundland jutting out into the Labrador Sea. You can sail around the top of Quebec via the Hudson Strait. Directly over the Hudson Strait is Baffin Island, a very large island, which is relatively parallel with the lower half of Greenland. Sailing through the Hudson Strait brings you into the Hudson Bay, an incredibly large bay that is approximately 650 miles or 1,050 kilometers wide. Sailing directly north of the bay will take you through a waterway between Baffin Island and the northern coast of North America, which extends for another 1,854 miles or nearly 3,000 kilometers. Finally, there are a maze of islands north of the Canadian coastline that make up its Arctic archipelago, which is neatly cut in half horizontally with a waterway called the Perry Channel. Now this more or less goes without saying, but it is incredibly cold in this part of the world. So cold, in fact, that these waterways are often frozen about 10 months out of the year and sometimes the whole year through. The ice that develops here is called pack ice, which will break up when it warms into pieces called flows. These flows can be several miles long and float down through the various straits and channels into the warmer Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. As a matter of fact, the iceberg that sank the Titanic was a piece that flowed down from the Arctic Ocean through Baffin Bay, the waterway between Greenland and Baffin Island. These flows can be as long as 10 feet thick and weigh thousands of tons. This makes traversing the Arctic incredibly dangerous in modern times, but even more so in the age of sail. There were several instances where ships would become trapped in a flow and carried for days or even weeks without any way to steer as the men on board prayed that it would lead them out into open water instead of crushing them against land or another flow. And ships did often get caught between flows, which would regularly lead to the hull being split in half and leaving the sailors to scramble over the sides onto the ice, marooned until rescue might come. Now initial forays into Canada's northern waterways go all the way back to the 1500s, but serious exploration began in the early 1600s with the likes of Samuel de Champlain and Henry Hudson. As their names might suggest to you, they are famous for discovering a number of waterways in North America. But what you might be surprised to know is that explorers like Hudson and some of his contemporaries were bankrolled, not by individual nations, 
but by merchant companies. In fact, all of Hudson's expeditions were variously financed by Dutch and English companies, each seeking to get an upper hand by finding the northwestern passageway to Asia. So Henry Hudson, in particular, took Arctic exploration to new territory, so to speak, on his 1610 expedition when he discovered his namesake bay. Having already undertaken two previous northern expeditions, he was well aware of the problem of having a very limited window to explore due to the waters freezing solid. So this time, instead of retreating when winter came, he deliberately stayed in the bay and let the ocean freeze around his ship, determined to make it through the winter and take up the search again when the Arctic summer came. Well, the experiment worked, and his ship remained intact after the ice melted. However, Hudson hadn't really calculated how much food he was going to need for this adventure, and the crew's health worsened through the winter. Matters reached ahead when some of them believed that Hudson was hoarding food away in his cabin. And though no food was found, they resolved to leave him, his young son, and 11 other loyal crewmen behind. They left him on a small boat as they set sail back to England, and that was the last that anyone ever heard of Hudson. Only eight of the 13 mutineers made it back alive. They were in incredibly poor health, and food stores had become so low that at one point they began rationing a pound of candles per man, per week, to eat. On the surface, this may seem like a disaster, and to be sure it was, but those in power chose to see success in the midst of it. Hudson had proven that it was possible for a ship to winter over in the Arctic, and so this became the tactic of future expeditions, though care was obviously taken to ensure that they were more properly provisioned. Our story picks up a little more than 200 years later in 1819. Britain is riding high after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which came to a close three years before. In particular, Britain's navy distinguished itself during these wars, captivating its allies and adversaries alike in the battles of Copenhagen and Trafalgar. With its massive fleet and sterling reputation, there was no question to anyone that Britannia did indeed rule the waves. However, not all was well for the kingdom and her navy. You see, with the nation at peace, there was no longer any reason to keep so many men and ships mustered. And so between 1813 and 1817, more than 100,000 sailors were let go, and numerous officers were sent home receiving only half wages. This created an economic slump, and left the Admiralty scrambling to find uses for their numerous warships and justify their budget to Parliament. Enter Sir John Barrow, Second Secretary of the Admiralty. As Second Secretary, Barrow ran the day-to-day -day affairs of the Admiralty, giving him considerable power and influence over nearly everything the Navy did. Barrow was not a one-note man, but for the purposes of our story, I'm only going to discuss his direction of expeditions. You see, Barrow realized one means of keeping officers employed and ships at sea was by putting together voyages of discovery. Though by this point much of the world had already been discovered, there were still a few blank spots left on the map. And as Britain looked to the new colonial horizon, Barrow put together expeditions to explore the Nile, and Timbuktu, and to otherwise map out portions of the African interior. However, what really interested John Barrow was his fascination and passion for discovering the legendary Northwest Passage. Barrow read everything he could get his hands on regarding past expeditions into the unknown North, as well as literature that focused on the financial benefits of such a trade route. You see... In olden days, cosmographers originally believed that the lands in the far north would be unlivable and their seas unnavigable because of all the ice. But those same cosmographers also believed that the lands around the equator would be too hot to support a culture. And so, when people groups were discovered living in the tropics as well as in the Arctic, thinking began to change. John Barrow himself firmly held to the maxim that there is no land uninhabitable nor sea unnavigable. Barrow believed in the open polar sea hypothesis, a hypothesis that more or less posited that northern bodies of water could not freeze completely due to hypothetical warm water currents flowing up through the Gulf Stream. If that were true, 
then there must be an open sea at the top of the world that could be approached during the northern hemisphere's warmest months. This kind of thinking quite literally flew in the face of the very accounts of Arctic exploration that fascinated Barrow. Whalers and explorers alike had to plan their voyages around Greenland carefully, because doing so too late or too early would make it unapproachable against the endless waves of ice. Even accounts like those of the surviving crew of Hudson's final expedition prove that the very ocean can freeze around a ship. But he nevertheless believed that these issues were caused by free-floating ice migrating down from an open polar sea. By 1819, Barrow had already launched several expeditions north, both looking for the passage as well as for the North Pole. To the last, their commanders had been turned back by ice, so Barrow considered coming at the passage in a new direction. This time he would send two ships, one led by Captain William Perry, which would sail through what would go on to become the Perry Channel, that body of water that neatly divides the Arctic archipelago, and the other by John Franklin that would take a crew to the western rim of Hudson Bay and have them trek north to meet up with Perry on Canada's northern coast by way of the Coppermine River. This was a most ambitious plan, as it not only presumed upon Perry sailing through treacherous, unknown waterways, but also on Franklin navigating some of the most inhospitable land on Earth before linking up and sailing back home. And on top of all of this, Franklin had no experience with overland expeditions whatsoever. So the questions are therefore begged, who was John Franklin? And why was he chosen over more experienced officers? To put it simply, John Franklin was a career Navy man who had a zeal for exploration. Born in 1786 to a grocer, Franklin joined the Navy at the age of 14 after his father pulled some strings to get him a Royal Navy appointment aboard the 64-gun HMS Polyphemus, under Admiral Nelson's squadron, no less. The following year, he saw his first action in the brutal Battle of Copenhagen before going on to join Matthew Flinders' expedition to map out the coast of Australia. Soon thereafter, he rejoined Nelson's squadron and saw action in several more battles, including the decisive Battle of Trafalgar. He was even present for the War of 1812, seeing action in the Battle of New Orleans in 1814, where he was wounded in the shoulder. Franklin was a lieutenant by then, but like so many other officers, he found himself out of work when Britain's wars came to an end. He petitioned everyone he knew from his previous adventure to Australia to help him secure a position on an expedition so that he might advance his career and earn a full salary. His persistence paid off in 1817 when Barrow assigned him to command one of two ships in an expedition seeking the rumored open polar sea. His party made it just north of present-day Svalbard, an archipelago north of Norway, before being turned back by the ice. Despite the setback, John Barrow took an instant liking to Franklin, and after a number of more experienced officers ran afoul of him, Barrow decided that Franklin should lead the overland portion of the Coppermine expedition. And if I may give a quick word here about John Franklin's personality, he was, for the age, considered to be rather short and portly. In his later years, he would grow to be obese, but even at the time of the Coppermine trip, he was described as being overweight and not used to strenuous labor. Now, this wasn't particularly uncommon of officers who were more in the business of directing men to work rather than working themselves, but what was uncommon was Franklin's soft personality. He was described as socially awkward, always uncomfortable when people he didn't know would walk up and praise him, and he rather disliked watching punishment meted out to his crewmen. This would go on to undermine the respect of his men, as well as some of the native guides and hunters on the Coppermine trip. They were unimpressed with his seemingly limitless compassion, even for animal life. Throughout his time in Canada, he would blow mosquitoes off of his skin rather than swatting at them, insisting that they had just as much a right to live as he did. This was really perplexing to the people who actually lived in Canada because these mosquitoes can grow to be so numerous that they block out the sun, and some believed that they could suck an adult caribou dry. 
But Franklin's immense piety and humility played very well to London high society's notion of the ideal Englishman, and so throughout his career he was, at times, given assignments that he had no real business leading, much as he was with the Coppermine trip. Once Franklin was chosen in February of 1819, he had three months to prepare before their May departure. Before departing, Franklin called on an aging Alexander Mackenzie for advice. Thirty years prior, Mackenzie had also led an expedition overland and sailed all the way to the Arctic coast on a river that was later named in his honor. Like Mackenzie, Franklin was going to be crossing nearly half of Canada to Great Slave Lake and then sail north to the coast on canoes. However, unlike the continuous and much wider Mackenzie, the Coppermine River can at times be little more than a meandering stream that connects larger bodies of water. It's full of switchbacks, rapids, and portages, and if you don't know what a portage is, that is essentially when a body of water becomes so shallow that your boat can't sail through it, so you have to pick it up and carry it until you get to deeper water. Nevertheless, Mackenzie gave Franklin three primary pieces of advice. One, get as far to the interior of Hudson Bay as possible before the winter frees up. Two, bring plenty of practical items to trade with the natives and consult them with a translator. And three, get as far inland as possible, waste no time on the Hudson Bay coast. With these things in mind, Franklin set to work securing the tons of foodstuff necessary to feed a party of 20-odd men for two years and picking out his subordinate officers. He chose John Richardson, a doctor and anatomist, to be his second-in-command, along with two lower-ranking officers with Arctic experience named Robert Hood and George Back, the latter of which had been part of Franklin's previous expedition to Svalbard. Finally, he brought along two ordinary seamen named John Hepburn and Samuel Wilkes. The other men necessary to make the trip a success, he thought that he could recruit once he reached Canada and found a fur trading post. Here is where the expedition encountered the first of numerous troubles caused by bad timing or bad planning. You see, as the party moved through the heart of the Great White North, they would be doing so right in the middle of a war zone. Throughout the previous 200-odd years, very little of the Canadian archipelago continued to be discovered and mapped. Interests instead were turned to the Canadian interior, where French and English merchant companies began to engage in the lucrative fur trade. Outposts and forts began to dot the map further and further into the Canadian wilderness, as Britain's Hudson's Bay Company fought to gain the upper hand against the Confederacy of French Companies, united under the name of the Northwest Company. For all of its notoriety, the Hudson's Bay Company only controlled about a fifth of the fur trade in Canada by 1819. And so, in the previous years, both companies turned to increasingly violent means of offenses and retaliations to undermine each other. This included acts of sabotage, arresting, and killing rival workers, as well as turning loyal indigenous groups loose to attack and otherwise harass one another. While the English and French companies skirmished with one another, they hired their own explorers to help map out the interior, with much attention given to the lakes and rivers, which could be used to transport pelts and supplies. Franklin intended to not only use the same trails and waterways these companies employed, but to also use their men and supplies as well. He was not merely expecting them to refrain from harassing him. He was expecting them to offer any aid necessary to the party for the common good of scientific discovery. His expectations began to tarnish the moment he left England aboard a Hudson's Bay Company ship when he was told that the previous winter season had been particularly harsh and the next one was expected to be even harsher. As a result, every Hudson's Bay Company man was needed to take supplies to the farthest outpost, and none could be spared for Franklin's journey. Fortunately for Franklin, the ship stopped at the Orkney Islands, just off the coast of Scotland, before crossing the Atlantic, and he immediately set about trying to find men that would be willing to manhole his supplies and equipment across Canada. 
He apparently had quite a bit of trouble as the herring catch was particularly good in Orkney that year, and few preferred to risk their lives in the frozen wilderness rather than stay home and catch fish. Nevertheless, Franklin was able to hire four stout men with previous experience in the Canadian wilderness. This brought their numbers up to ten, still roughly half of what was going to be needed to make a full trip. And speaking of the trip, rather than sailing to the far northwestern portion of the bay and traversing the so-called barren lands to the Arctic coast, Franklin was persuaded to take a more well-known route. This would see his band sailing two-thirds of the way around the bay, then traveling up the Hayes River and its tributaries north, stopping at friendly Hudson's Bay Company posts such as York Factory and Cumberland House before stopping for the winter. The following summer, they would take a difficult and meandering trek north to Great Slave Lake and sail up the Coppermine River to the Coppermine area. This journey would see the group travel about 5,500 miles across the four modern provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, and none of it. By the way, apologies to my non-American, Liberian, and Burmese listeners, but Great Britain was still using the imperial system of measurement at the time, and so for simplicity's sake, so shall I. Now trouble struck again when the ship landed at York Factory on August 30th. Seaman Samuel Wilkes fell so ill during their transatlantic crossing that he was sent back home as soon as they arrived, bringing their numbers back down to nine. On top of that, the governor of York Factory told Franklin flatly that they had no canoes to spare, and the best they could do was offer him a single York boat. Now, a York boat is a fine craft. It's about 45 feet long, and it could be propelled either by oar or by sail and was designed to move cargo. The issue, however, lay in that it was just big enough to hold Franklin's party of nine and only about half of the food that he brought for the journey. Realizing just how short the summers were in Canada, he now calculated that the trip was going to take three years instead of two. As Franklin contemplated what to do next, he spoke to three Northwest Company prisoners who advised him to either stay were set out immediately to Cumberland House because winter in the wilderness would be death. Franklin would not abide staying the winter on the coast, essentially losing a year. So instead, he decided to sacrifice his provisions, including most of his meat, rum, flour, and ammunition to make a mad dash for Cumberland House 700 miles away. However, to reassure the men, the governor did promise Franklin that he would ford his leftover supplies upriver once the summer thaw came. They finally departed York Factory on the 9th of September, with winter closing in around them. Their journey over the Hayes River came and went in fits because of the shallows and the rapids. When the water became too shallow or the rapids ahead looked too rough, which it often did more than once a day, they would unload the boat and pull it over the rocks by rope before reloading it and carrying on. Some days they made it as far as 20 miles. Other days they made it a mile and a half. The labor was, of course, miserable, but the effect made the journey more miserable from having to wade through the meltwater with ropes. Needless to say, this burned calories at a tremendous rate, with the men eating as much as 8 pounds of meat per man per day. I don't know this for certain, but one source I drew from reported that the Lewis and Clark expedition allowed as much as nine pounds per day. Along the way, Midshipman Hood drew a map of every turn in the journey, determined to make the most of the trip and to perhaps fill in a book he hoped to publish once they were back in England. He described the country as being flat, with very few waterfalls, and the river changing direction often. A little more than a week after they left York Factory, Franklin made the difficult decision of once again cutting his supplies in half. It was beginning to snow heavily now, and the amount of time it took the men to unload and reload supplies when they encountered shallows was seriously threatening their chances to make it to Cumberland House before real winter set in. Of the group's roughly 35 crates of supplies, 16 were left on the shore with the hope that they, like the others, would be forwarded to Cumberland House before they left the following spring. Let's 
summer of 18, the fall of 21. That's what they had told you. Fresh clothes every two months, plenty of meat, and most importantly, that sweet, sweet expedition pay. Twice what you can make staying at home catching the herring. Besides, it's supplied and funded by the government, with assistance on every leg of the journey from the same fur companies that you'd worked for in the past. That's how they lured you away from Orkney, and that's how they persuaded you to give up two years of your life to the harsh Canadian wilderness. As you crouch leaning on your pole in the York boat, wheezing and shivering against the winter's first real winds, you think about the last four months, cursing your stupidity for trusting these prissy English officers. They told you that you were to be part of a grand expedition, among the first men to find a northwestern passage to Asia. Now you weren't even sure that they could find their way to the next fort before winter's icy fingers take hold of you all. You look back at your mates from Orkney. The sound of their chattering teeth is as loud as the water around you. No one is in a mood to talk. Then the dreaded words come. All right, lads, let's hop over these rocks. The boat has become beached on a rocky shallow for the second time today, and for a second time you are going to have to pick it up and carry it over. As some of the other men begin to untie the ropes holding the expedition supplies in place, you lay down your pole and drop off the side of the boat. You audibly gasp as your feet hit the freezing water and splashes up your leg. You think that you should be used to the feeling by now, since your pants never really dried out after this morning's portage. But the fresh snap of cold jolts your nerves as sharply as the first time. You begin to shake, standing in the shin-high water, with your arms extended out, screaming mental curses at the men for not being quicker. One by one, the packages do come, and gradually a small pile of them begins to build on the snow-kissed shore. Much too small for a journey this size, you think. You haven't even been in country for two weeks, and yet these officers, in all their brilliance, have sacrificed half of the food stores, twice, in the mere name of making some kind of progress before winter. Such arrogance was going to be the death of you all, even if you do survive the winter. After several long minutes, you stack the last package on the pile and stamp your damp feet in place, trying to get some sort of feeling back into your numbed nerves. You watch as the other men are laying out the smooth poplar trunks in front of the boat. A York boat is much too heavy for the ten of you to carry, so instead you take a dozen or so small logs and roll the boat over the top of the rocky ground. There are maybe ten yards of rocks between the boat and deeper water, so you'll probably have to reset the rollers three or four times for this move. Grudgingly, you force yourself to move into place near the bow and wait for the order to push the boat forward. When it comes, you grip the side and heave with all your might, and as the craft begins to move, you look down, careful to step over the rollers as you go. You reach the end of the poplars, and as the boat comes to a stop, you hear a cry behind you. You turn around to see the last man has missed one of the rollers and is face down on the rocks. You cringe as he picks his bloodied face off the ground, and some of the other men help him to his feet. You all take turns resetting the poplars before heaving and resetting them again four more times. Finally, the boat comes to rest in enough open water to float, and you all stop to catch a quick breath. The water sounds somehow louder here, and as you look ahead, you see that the river curves just out of sight behind a rise of rocks. You pray that there aren't rapids ahead, or if there are, that they won't be so bad as to require all of this drudgery again. With aching muscles, you pull yourself back onto the boat and crouch down, waiting for the others to come with the boxes. Slowly they come over the ice-slicked rocks, walking like a newborn deer taking its first faltering steps, and begin handing you supplies. After so many portages in the last week, you've memorized the shape and weight of every box, and so stack them with expert precision before tying them in place with your best seaman's knots. As you finish, you hop back off the boat and walk over to where the men have gathered around a small fire. It seems that one of the officers, who had not been present for the portage, had taken the time to brew some tea and was doling out a cup to everyone. 
Your belly growls with anticipation as the officer puts the blessedly warm mug into your shaking hand. Waves of relief rack your chilled body as you put the hot liquid to your lips. You chat with the others and take turns doing your best impressions of the captain just out of earshot. Moments like these are what get you through the day. A pitiful thought you know, but one true nonetheless. The tea is cold by the time you get to the bottom of your mug. You know from experience that true winter in Canada is going to be much colder than it is now in September. But you can't help but to wonder how cold the Arctic is going to be. How in God's earth could anyone abide living in a place so cold they build their houses out of ice? You hear the captain calling everyone back to their poles and sighs you put away your mug. Two more years, you think. Two more beautiful years of securing Britain's glory over a barren land that almost no one will ever see. God save the king, you think, and us too while you're at it. The trip was gloomy for other reasons as well. Along the way, the men saw the sad sight of dying Cree Indians fleeing north and west in the same general direction that they were traveling in. These were refugees fleeing from European diseases, like whooping cough that was killing their people in scores. The party would go on to see much more of this as they encountered other indigenous groups along the journey. But finally, on September 23rd, they reached Cumberland House, having to break through the last 200 yards of ice in Cumberland Lake just to dock. They had nearly bisected Manitoba and had just barely beaten winter. Their arrival was met with lukewarm reception, and they were disappointed to discover there was no room for them to quarter with the Hudson's Bay Company men, and they would have to erect their own building to live in that winter. As temperatures dropped into the negative 40s, Franklin and his officers drew up plans for the summer ahead. They came to the conclusion that they would have to build a fort in the copper mine area to survive the following winter before journeying to the Arctic coast the next spring. They also decided to take advantage of George Back's fluency in French to hire some Northwest Company voyageurs to round out the party's numbers. As I mentioned earlier, Canada was a land largely devoid of roads, bridges, or any other means of transportation. So moving supplies in and out of the country's farthest flung corners was an immense task that required men willing to sail and manhaul sledges over rugged terrain. The most famous of these were the French voyageurs, who made a career of providing the grueling labor necessary to keep the trade going. These were men who were accustomed to traveling light and living off the land. They provisioned lightly and only ever thought of the day ahead, knowing that survival was never guaranteed in the wilds of Canada. The plan, then, was to depart Cumberland House for a 240-mile journey to Carleton House in southwestern Saskatchewan, then travel along the Beaver River to a place called ile la Crosse, where the natives gathered to play lacrosse, before eventually reaching the northeastern portion of Alberta to entreat the fur companies for provisions and men to take them to the Arctic coast. They would further petition the companies to help them hire some local Diné hunters to travel with the group to the copper mine area, where along the way they would help them to hunt and provide a show of force against any other unfriendly native groups that they might encounter. Knowing that winter came more quickly in the Arctic than it did for Lower Canada, the men decided to waste no time waiting for spring and decided to set out for Carleton House in January of 1820. This was only possible through an act of unusual generosity by Cumberland House officials that provided them with dog sleds, teams of voyageurs, and snowshoes, since traveling by water was impossible at that time of year. Each of these three sleds held 300 pounds of their supplies, while the officers would walk alongside in snowshoes. Crossing the country in January proved to be incredibly difficult, especially for the Englishmen who had no previous experience with wilderness survival. They slept under buffalo skin blankets with dogs either next to or lying on top of them for extra warmth. Reading Back's journal, it seems like he took pride in traveling easier than Franklin, as he notes his bulky frame and wheezing. 
Franklin himself wrote a number of times in his journal that the officers, who carried little more than their own supplies, suffered worse than the common men, and that he suffered worse than any of them. But more on his thoughts later. It took 13 days, but they finally reached Carlton House on January 13th. This trip provided the officers with their first real glimpse at the hardships ahead, as provisions ran low and hypothermia began to wear them down by the time they reached shelter. Hot tea would freeze before reaching their lips, and their dogs were described as moving drunkenly in the snow, stupefied by the cold. Before the year was out, it would be the men starving, frostbitten, and wandering around drunkenly. Nevertheless, once they reached Carlton House, they decided to take a week to rest and trade with the local natives. They were on the edge of buffalo country now, and the Assiniboine, or Stone Indians as they were sometimes called, made their living by hunting and trading meat and furs to the Europeans. However, there was little in the way of quantity or quality that season. Like the Cree, the Assiniboine were also dying of the epidemics being brought north by fleeing refugees. It's estimated that a third of the area's native peoples had died at this time from either measles or whooping cough. Nevertheless, Franklin dipped into his own pocket and purchased ten bags of pemmican from them. For anyone unaware, pemmican is a cube-shaped mixture of meat, berries, and fat. Dried meat usually consisted of buffalo, venison, caribou, that would be pounded down into a kind of powder and mixed with an equal amount of fat with a helping of cranberries or some other local berry thrown in. If prepared correctly, it can last for years and makes a perfect food staple for those traveling out on the frontier. However, there was no room to carry these bags on the sled, so Franklin reserved them with the understanding that they, like his other supplies left along the trail, would be forwarded to Fort Chippewyan in the spring. Franklin also forwarded letters to both the French Fort of Chippewyan, as well as the British Fort of Wedderburn in northeast Alberta, entreating them to help secure native guides and to spare any resources they could for their journey north. There were many unknowns beginning to pile up at this point. Could they find friendly and resourceful natives to help them survive? Could they find men to manhole their supplies, and to that end, could they even find enough supplies to make a journey to the coast? The officers were uncertain, but they had to find answers to these questions quickly if they were going to make the year worthwhile. They set out again in early February, traveling by dog sled and snowshoeing before reaching ile la crosse two weeks later. They took rest at a local trading post and gathered their strength, for at this point the dog sleds and their teams had turned back for Cumberland House. After a week, they departed for Fort Chippewyan, encountering still more signs of a dying people ravaged by disease, death, and grief. On March 26, they finally reached it, having traveled some 857 miles from Cumberland House in the near dead of winter, and still some 1,500 miles from York Factory. Franklin calculated that if previous estimates and the descriptions of local natives were true, then they still had another 600 miles to go before they reached the Arctic coast. Now, after everything that the group had seen, the Northwestern Company's Fort Chippewyan looked like a small village, and for all practical purposes it was, positioned on the north side of Lake Athabasca, about a mile from the Hudson's Bay Company Fort of Wedderburn. It was a far more comfortable place than what the party had become accustomed to, and it allowed them to rest as they drew up more plans and began to parlay with the fur companies. It took about two months, but near the end of May, representatives from the two opposing forts came together on neutral ground to discuss outfitting the expedition with men and supplies. After some back and forth, the companies agreed to split the cost evenly, and decided that they would need at least 20 men to make a show of force to any unfriendly Inuit, and at least three canoes to reach the copper mine area. The canoes were provided from their own stock, as were 16 voyageurs, many of which were half-blooded Cree, and were hired at double their usual salary. It should be said that Franklin's plan presumed upon much, and none of it more than food. Before the party made their trip to Fort Chippewyan, Richardson and Hood had actually returned south to look for an Inuit interpreter, more men, and chiefly the crates of food that had been left behind on the trail. 
With the expedition now boasting nearly 30 members, the burden fell upon Franklin to feed and clothe the new explorers. And doing the math, a 90-pound bag of pemmican might last a group this size three days, and with an estimated time of 60 days to reach the Arctic coast, that meant that they needed nearly a ton of food just to get to their destination, never mind the time that they would actually spend exploring the coast. And that was further presuming that they wouldn't need to survive another winter in the fort that they intended to build. And at this point, the officers were indeed presuming that another winter wouldn't be necessary, as they would undoubtedly link up with Captain Perry's ship and be back in England by the following autumn. Well, Richardson and Hood returned in mid-July, and what they returned with were more men and little food. Traveling back to the Hudson's Bay Company posts along the trail, the pair had recruited an additional ten men, both of Orkney stock as well as voyageurs. They made inquiries about the crates of supplies they were expecting and were told that none had yet reached the outposts. Undeterred, they made their way back to Ile La Crosse to pick up the pemmican they had reserved, only to discover that somehow it had gone putrid in the couple of months that they had been away. Again, if properly prepared, pemmican is supposed to last for years, so this was quite an unexpected blow to morale. So it was that Richardson and Hood returned, hat in hand, hoping that Franklin had managed to have better luck than they. The officers took stock of their remaining supplies, and what they had left was two barrels of flour, some chocolate, arrowroot, condensed soup, and a bit of dried meat. They decided that all of these meager supplies would have to be saved for the coming winter once they built their fort. Upon hearing the news that there would be no additional food and no fresh cloth for the upcoming journey, three of the Orkney men quit on the spot, not wanting to be part of what they saw as an expedition doomed to fatigue and famine. Franklin then fired three more after they too raised concerns about food. Somehow, the officers convinced the remaining 20 voyageurs and their wives, as two or three of them decided to bring their wives with them, that the Yellowknife Indians the companies had promised to hire would be able to hunt more than enough food to keep them fed on the journey beyond the fort. Nevertheless, Franklin did ask the fort to provide them for food for their first day out, but, having grown tired of the expedition's frequent requests, they declined. So it was that the party of 27 departed Fort Chippewyan on July 18th, canoeing north to Great Slave Lake. Before leaving the fort, Franklin wrote to the expedition's benefactor, John Barrow, updating him on their progress and their plans ahead. Writing of how the officers planned to survive outside the protections of the fur companies, he wrote that they were agreed in three opinions. Quote, First, that the party must now pass the next winter on the border of some lake well stocked with fish. Second, the party must be a sufficient force when approaching the sea to overawe the Eskimo, about twenty, but they do not suppose that the tribes near the coast are either so numerous or so hostile as near to the mouth of the Mackenzie River. Third, the Indians who know that part of the country best and must accompany the expedition as guides and hunters are called Red Knives. The Northwestern Company alone trade with these and have promised to procure them. Unquote. These Red Knives that Franklin referred to are a group of the Dene people that dwelt primarily around Great Slave Lake, the world's tenth largest lake, and along the Coppermine and Back Rivers. They were also most often referred to as yellow knives, so for simplicity's sake, that is the name that I'm going to refer to them by. The expedition embarked with about a week's worth of food that they hoped would last until they could rendezvous with a particular band of yellow knives that had done much trading and hunting for the Northwest Company in the past. The voyageurs were not at all worried about food, as they were used to living off the land, but this outlook was in sharp contrast to Franklin, who was used to ships stocked with years' worth of food and supplies. Food aside, the first night out was a disaster, with them camping in a swamp. They were set upon by a thunderstorm so violent that it caused their tents to collapse, and they were all forced to take shelter under their canoes until the following morning to get away from the millions of freshly hatched mosquitoes. 
However, the following days were better, and they reached Great Slave Lake on the 24th, and hopped from island to island until they reached the Northwest Company Fort Providence on July 29th. Once they arrived, they met with Willard Wenzel, a man with two decades' worth of experience dealing with the Yellow Knives, who agreed to act as their liaison. The expedition set up a camp along the shore of the lake, raised an ensign pole, and the officers put on their best European garb to try to impress the Yellow Knife leader. A few hours later, several canoes came up, and a man stepped out to introduce himself as Akecho, a name that translates to Bigfoot. Akecho was the leader of this particular band of hunters, and before he would even agree to speak with them, they first had to engage in a ritual smoke, which they did over some rum that the English distributed. When the pipe ran empty, Akecho told them that he was prepared to take them as far north as the mouth of the copper mine, but would go no further, as they and the Inuit were lifelong enemies. Along the way, he would hunt for them, but he warned him that the season was already far advanced for game. Undeterred, this put Franklin in chipper spirits, and he thanked him, telling him that the great father in England would repay all their debts. Akecho was unimpressed with his promise, but his men, and Franklin's, spent the rest of that night drinking the last of the rum and showing off their respective people's songs and dances to one another. Before they had even set out the next day, Franklin had managed to offend the Kecho. After Franklin's tent had caught fire in the revelry, he attempted to hide that fact from the Kecho, worried that he might take it as a bad omen for the trip. But the Kecho found out about this and was in turn offended and insisted that he be treated as an equal on this expedition insisting that he was no fool and wouldn't risk his people's lives for a reckless endeavor. They set out on August the 2nd on the Yellowknife River, a shallow and rapid river 140 miles north. The plan now was to reach Winter Lake and build an encampment that would see them through the winter, which was quickly approaching in the higher northern latitudes that they were now in. There were frequent portages that required as many as four trips to carry everything. Food was an immediate problem. They ran out of water on the 5th. They had a few pounds of fresh meat and portable soups, but otherwise they had to fish every day. There's a funny little antidote that George Back apparently impressed the yellow knives with his fly fishing, who were amazed that the fish could be fooled by a mere bit of string. But even so, the portages grew longer and the river grew thinner, often leaving them to carry everything over rocky miles and as the men grew hungrier, morale took a plunge. On August 13th, the party had a particularly hard day that broke the men. The stream had become so shallow that they carried their canoes for nearly 13 hours, paddling briefly wherever they could. And when the hunters returned home that night, they brought only enough food for dinner and the next morning's breakfast. This was a bridge too far, and the men became mutinous. Franklin glosses over this part of the journey in his journal, but George Back made it clear what happened in his. Quote, Mr. Franklin told them that we were too far removed from justice to treat them as they merited, but if such a thing occurred again, he would not hesitate to make an example of the first person who should come forward by blowing out his brains. Unquote. The men quietly resumed their work, and much to everyone's relief, the hunters began bringing meat in every day after the 16th. On the 19th, they made it 140 miles north to Winter Lake, two weeks after they had started, though they were still at this point hundreds of miles from the coast. Matters took a dour turn on the 26th, as while building the encampment they would go on to call Fort Enterprise, Akecho's brother-in-law died, leaving the Yellow Knives in a state of mourning so severe that they ceased to hunt. This obviously displeased the entire expedition, who were almost wholly reliant on the Yellow Knives for food, but it most displeased Franklin, who, in an incredible stroke of hubris, wanted to press on to the Arctic shore with bare weeks between them and winter's grip. Akecho pointed out the insanity of such a proposal, as it was already getting quite cold and the caribou and geese had already begun to migrate to the south. Furthermore, if they continued that far north, they would be above the tree line, meaning that they would be unable to gather wood with which to make a fire. Franklin countered, saying that their scientific instruments would tell them when true winter had set in, and at the first sign of it, they would turn back. 
Sensing that Franklin could not be reasoned with, Akecho said to him, Since we brought you hither, it shall not be said that we permitted you to die alone. Some of my young men will also go, but the moment they embark in the canoe, we who remain shall suppose them to be devoted to death and begin in consequence to mourn their loss. However, what finally convinced Franklin to remain was not the prospect of scant food, but of the winter weather. These men had been wearing the same clothes for months, and with winter setting in, they needed fresh caribou skins if they were going to survive the coming freeze. So they set about the task of building their fort and hunting caribou. While they did this, he sent two parties north in an attempt to find an Inuit guide that could take them the remaining miles to the coast. Sudden snowstorms befell these parties almost the moment they left, and after only a couple of days, they returned with no guides. In the meantime, the fort was constructed, and the hunters slew 45 caribou out of a migrating herd of about 2,000 passing by the camp. This outfitted all of them with comfortable clothing and a great deal of meat. Had Akecho let the expedition go on, they would have been one to 200 miles up the copper mine, which was, by this point, completely frozen solid, with no wood, no food, and no Arctic clothing. Franklin obviously still had much to learn of Arctic survival. As the explorers of the copper mine expedition hunkered down for yet another winter, there was one thing on their minds. Perry. Every sacrifice made, every snowstorm, every bitter night survived was leading them towards absolution on the northern coast. Imagine years of exploration predicated on rescue from a man that none of them had heard from in years. Without Perry, these men would have to work their way back through the frozen tundra above the tree line and retrace their steps, facing yet another long, brutal Canadian winter. There is a true element of tragedy at play in the story of the Coppermine Expedition, tragedy that comes as a result of foreknowledge of what comes next for these explorers. As while we know Franklin will survive this experience, what we also know, and what I haven't told you yet, is that Perry is not coming to save them. There will be no triumphant return to England through the mythic Northwest Passage. There won't be a rescue. There will be brutally cold, icy, desolate deaths. And even worse, a threat from within the group itself. They didn't know it yet, but within their midst was a killer. Michael and I hope that you've enjoyed the beginnings of Ends of the Earth. This series will take us through the end of this year and beyond. So be sure to watch our podcast platforms and social media feed to keep up with all the latest episodes. We've also got much more in store for Grizzly History throughout the end of the year, including new episodes of Apocrypha, bonus content, short-form history content, interviews, and much more. As always, if you've enjoyed what you've heard thus far, please consider following the show on your preferred podcast player interacting with our social media channels, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Your early support will help us shape what Grizzly History becomes and can be. Grizzly History is a podcast hosted by myself, Graham Parker, and produced by Michael Ruiz. For more information on the show, as well as links to our various platforms, please visit our website, grizzlyhistory.com. Finally, if you have any commercial or narration work that requires a voiceover talent, I am available, and I'd love to get in touch with you please reach out to my email address, graham at grisleyhistory.com, and I'd be happy to talk to you about your upcoming project. Again, that's G-R-A-H-A-M at grisleyhistory.com. That's all from us for now, but be sure to tune in in a few weeks to hear the continuation of the story of the Coppermine Expedition and the next episode of Ends of the Earth.